Okay. Um, hopefully you have all gotten the syllabus up and running. Let me pull put it up on my um, computer. Uh, this is who I am. My name is Paul Klawinski. You can call me Dr. Klawinski. You can call me Paul. Um, if you call me anything else, just don't let me hear it. <laughs> um, students sometimes find it weird that I prefer, actually, that students call me by their first name. There's a reason for that. Uh, when I was a graduate student, I was working on my master's degree with this guy named Fred Rainwater, who was my professor as an undergraduate, and then he was my thesis advisor. And after, at the end of your master's program, you do a thesis. You write a big, long research paper, and you get up in front of your department and, and the faculty in your department, and you defend that thesis. And then after you're done, you go out in the hall, and you wait for them to issue a verdict as to whether or not you're actually going to get your master's degree. And um, so I'm sitting out in the hall, and Fred Rainwater comes out, and he's like, you passed. I'm like, great, I passed. I can go and do the next thing, which is to do this all over again and get a PhD. And uh, so after he told me that, he told me, you know, there are always revisions to make on your thesis after it's done. And uh, I said, Dr. Rainwater, I just want to thank you for, you know, being my mentor, et cetera, et cetera. He's like, wait, call me Fred. I'm like, what? Call you Fred? I've never called you Fred the entire six years that I've known you. And it took me probably a decade after that to get familiar enough with him and feel comfortable enough with him to call him Fred because for six years I had called him Dr. Rainwater. But for him, something flipped in his brain. I was no longer a student. I was now a colleague. You don't call your colleagues Dr. Rainwater. You call your colleagues by their first name. And I thought that that was an artificial distinction because the only thing that separates me from you is that I've been doing this a lot longer than you have. You all are capable of doing anything that I'm capable of doing. You just haven't learned how to do it yet. So if you feel more comfortable calling me Dr. Klawinski and struggling with my last name, that's fine. If you prefer to just call me Paul, that's fine too. We're going to spend a lot of time with me hovering over your shoulder looking at your screen as you work through coding in R for this class. And you might be more comfortable with Paul hanging over your shoulder than Dr. Polinsky hanging over your shoulder. Do whatever is most comfortable to you. Um, so data science. This class used to be a class that was offered as an elective for people who were interested in going to graduate school. When you go to graduate school, knowing something about statistics is really useful. And so that's why I started offering this class. When they created the data science program, they decided to make the class a requirement for data science. And so that's why you find yourselves here. So um, when I started teaching the course for data science, I revamped the course somewhat because I know a lot of you are in business analytics. And so rather than having tons of examples from biology, there's now more of a mixture of examples. We're going to talk about some examples over the next couple of days that come from healthcare and criminal justice. So there are some things that are going to be biological, but there are going to be other things that apply to business of religion in some cases, uh, sociology, uh, linguistics, anthropology. You'll see a bunch of different kinds of data sets. But it's basically a class about data analysis. So the structure of the class is at the beginning of the class, we're going to spend some time talking about theory. What are the theories that underlie our ability to do statistics? And these theories are foundational theories that essentially allow you to understand any statistical technique that you'll ever be confronted with. If you can master a couple of core concepts, those core concepts will get you through a lot. And so I want you to have those under your belt firmly before we go and start doing a bunch of statistics because all of those different statistical techniques we will use are just basically variations on a theme. And so we'll spend some time at the beginning on theory. We'll hammer that pretty hard. 
you're going to feel that I'm really redundant because I keep talking about the same thing over and over again, but it's because those core concepts are really crucial. And I'll, I'll hopefully illustrate to you why those are, are really crucial. Then after that, we're going to go through the process of learning a series of different techniques. Start easy with things like chi-square analysis, then we'll go on to two sample tests, then we'll talk about ANOVA, two-way ANOVAs, regression, and we'll finish up with analysis of covariance. So we're gonna cover a lot of different techniques. And the way we'll cover this is by the following sequence. I will give you, I will teach you about the technique. I will then make you work the technique by hand. When I was learning statistics, we always worked things out by hand before we did anything on a computer for a couple of reasons. One, my first statistics class, we didn't have computers. Literally, we didn't have computers. Um, you didn't get to mess with statistics on computers until you got to graduate school. So we worked everything by hand, but I found the experience of working things out by hand really taught me how the technique actually operates. And so by working things by hand, you figure out how it operates. Once you've worked things by hand, you'll get a problem set where you're required to work a set of problems with that technique by hand. Then we will show you how to code this, and then we will give you a real data set, and you will write a report on that data set. You'll do that for analysis of variance. You'll do that for regression. You'll do that for um, analysis of a two-way analysis of variance. You'll do that for an analysis of covariance. So the practice will cover a lot of different kinds of topics, a lot of different kinds of data. The reports, though, are going to be all part of this large integrated data set that I happen to own. So the reports come from a data set from my own research that is a biological data set. So understand that first and foremost. But the thing that I like about it and the reason that I use it is because for each of these things, for analysis of variance, the two-way analysis of variance, for regression, and for analysis of covariance, all of those things can be used to analyze the data that's in this one big data set. By revisiting that data set over and over again, you become familiar with that data set. And so each time you go to write a report, you're not having to familiarize yourself with a new data set, a new set of ideas. You're just familiarizing yourself with a new technique for looking at those data. As a data scientist, you're invariably going to come into contact with people who have a data set, they bring it to you, and they say, here's this data, what the heck do I do with it? Why do I know that this is the case? Because this happens to me all the time. <laughs> as soon as people figure out that you have some skills in analyzing data, people will find a path to your door. When I was, well, I guess I was working here at the time. I worked with a group of people in Puerto Rico and at a meeting of this re group of researchers in Puerto Rico, these two guys came up to me and said, hey, we've got this data set on landslide ecology. Uh, landslides happen in the tropics a lot. They happen in other places also, but they're really prone to happen on the island of Puerto Rico. And after a landslide occurs, you just have this bare rock, and over time, the community of organisms that used to be there slowly repopulates that bare ground that is a result of the landslide. And these were plant biologists, and they were interested in kind of how this process of recovery after a landslide happens. And so what they did was they just went out and they measured everything they could possibly measure about this landslide, a, a, series, a whole series of landslides, actually. And so they had all of these different variables hoping that somewhere in that mass of data, some pattern would emerge that would tell them something about how these landslides were recovering after the landslide happened. Well, the problem with that is that they didn't really think through what actually might be important and reduce the number of variables that they were actually looking at so that they would have something tractable. And People do this a lot of times. They don't know what they need to be collecting data on, so they collect data on everything. And that's fine. 
but it becomes difficult to analyze because you have actually just too much to look at, in a sense. If you go to graduate school and you take a multivariate statistics class, they will teach you some techniques by which you can look for correlations among variables and combine those variables into a new variable that is made up of contributions of those other of all those little related variables. And it's a technique called principal component analysis. I took a course in multivariate statistics when I was in graduate school, and so I know how to do principal component analysis. These guys had not done that, so they did not know how to do that. And so they're like, hey, will you help us with our data analysis? I'm like, will you make me a co-author on the paper? They're like, sure. I'm like, okay, sure. So they gave me this data set. My first task was to understand what their questions were and to understand what the data set was about. So I spent a lot of time, probably two months of emails and phone calls and stuff back and forth. Uh, one of these guys was in Hawaii. One was at University of Nevada, Las Vegas. I was here. Um, we were all spread out, so we were doing all this via phone call and email. It took about two months for me to figure out what their data set was about, what the kinds of questions were that they were having, before I could even start to sit down and, and play around with the data. Once I did that, I analyzed the data, I got the answer that I thought was the right answer, and I basically wrote a report for them. And the report consisted of what I had done with the data. Well, the first thing it had was what I understood to be their questions that they had about the data. Then after that, I basically described how I treated the data. If I did any data transformations, what were they and why did I do them? What techniques I used to analyze the data? And then I wrote a results section that basically described what came out of that analysis. That's the thing that I'm asking you guys to do for each of these things. Pretend that some researcher has come to you with a data set. The researcher doesn't know what to do with the data set, has come to you for assistance, asked you to analyze it for them. So you need to make sure that you understand what the questions are that that researcher is asking. You describe fully what the analysis is about, and then you describe fully what that analysis produced. And that's what these reports are about. There's not an introduction. There's not a conclusion. There's just a statistical methods. What did I do and why did I do it? And what did I find? And that's what these, these things are about. Questions about kind of the structure of the class. Okay. Um, All those techniques that I just mentioned to you are found in the course objectives. By the time you get out of here, you should be able to do any of these things. Will you remember how to do these things two years from now? Maybe, maybe not. But if you understand the core concepts that we concentrate at the beginning of the semester, and the fact that you have done these in the past, you'll actually have some code that you generate to do these analyses in the future. You should be able, you know, five years from now to be able to go back and if somebody does ask you to utilize one of these techniques, your core knowledge of statistical theory combined with the fact that you have experience having done this in the past should allow you to retool yourself really quickly uh, in the future. That would be my goal for you at least. To make you useful to people after you get out of here. Da, 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 da. Oh, mode of delivery. Thanks for wearing your mask today. I appreciate it. I really didn't want to be here. <laughs> in this place, with everybody masked, at this particular time in history. Um, unfortunately, we find ourselves here. Right now, I, I told you this in the email. Right now, I've changed the designation of this class to hybrid synchronous in the event that something happens and we have to go back online because half of you have to quarantine or something like this. I had a class last semester, my evolutionary ecology class. One student was diagnosed with COVID. As a result of contact tracing, half of the class was quarantined. Like half of a class of like 30 people was quarantined. It made it very difficult to then carry on class as we had been carrying it on before. And so, um, 
well, Claire was there. You remember this. We walked in. I was like, where is everybody? Well, they're all in quarantine. So, um, so I changed it formally in the event that we have to do something different. My goal is to be with you daily in class because especially with live coding, having taught this class completely online once, having taught this class for half a semester in person and half a semester online, especially when we started doing the online part right when we were getting to a lot of the live coding, it's just really hard to do live coding if I can't go up and look over your shoulder, look at your screen quickly and easily and help you figure out what's going on. So, let's all work together to keep us in class together by doing things that are sane. Staying masked while you're in class, in this class and also in other classes as well. If you go out to the grocery store, if you go to a restaurant or whatever, stay masked. Um, associate with people who are vaccinated <laughs> as much as you can. Um, lots of things that you can do to keep us kind of in session normally. Can you guys hear me okay through the mask? Okay, good. My first time wearing N95 masks, I was wearing cloth masks last year, but because Omicron seems to be more transmissible, I've upgraded to an N95 mask, so I just don't know how I'm going to project. This thing picks up my voice very closely, transmits it to the video. If it sounds like I'm shouting at you on the video, it's because I feel like I'm shouting at you to be heard. Um, just turn down the volume on the video if you go watch the videos. Um, after today, I will upload this video. As soon as that is uploaded, I'll have an address for the playlist for this course. I'll put that on the Moodle site and you can go and look at the videos anytime you want. Um, so let's try and, and stay together uh, this semester as much as possible by being careful. That's, that's the main thing, be, be careful. Um, a lot of this is boilerplate language that they require us to put in the syllabus, the inclusive learning environment language. I don't really have much to add to it, so I pretty much just, just put in there what they gave me. Um, this is one of those classes where perspectives and worldviews don't really matter that much because we're dealing with data. So I can't imagine that there are a lot of, of really difficult, hairy, ethical or world perspective issues that we're going to deal with beyond the first couple of days. The first couple of days, I'm actually going to cover a couple of things that you might find uncomfortable, but I'm always going to be approaching it from a data perspective. And But after that, it's just going to be pretty much crunching data. Oh, I forgot to bring my book. Uh, there's a book, Quinn and Keo says experimental design and data analysis for biologists. It is a book that is written for biologists, but it's one of the clearest books that I've seen written for basic statistics that covers all of the techniques that we will be using. They use relatively clear language. They are relatively comprehensive in their coverage. The other advantage is all of the data sets that they analyze in that book are available. So we will use examples from that book primarily because we have access to the full data set and I didn't have to go digging it up somewhere. I'll show you today, creating your own data sets that are interesting and relevant actually takes quite a lot of work. And um, so when I can find data sets that are already constructed, those are always nice to use. It's a good reference book. You might want to hold on to it after you leave here. Once again, one of the things I like about it is the fact that it's written in relatively plain language because it's intended for biologists Nothing against the biologists in the room, but we're not that smart when it comes to statistics. You have to speak plainly to us in order for us to get it. And so um, so that's, that's the reason that I chose the book. I could have chose a bunch of other books that I just found more obtuse. Um, we're going to be programming in R. How many of you have experience with R? Okay. One person and to a little bit. Okay, all right. So that's good. I know kind of where I'm starting with you. One of the first things I'm going to do, I'll post these probably tomorrow sometime, a set of online tutorials to kind of get you into R so that when we start working with R together, you're, it's not totally foreign to you. 
uh, somebody created a, an online tutorial called Swirl. You can download it or upload it as a package in R and um, then it takes you through a series of, of basic tutorials. They have some more elaborate tutorials, but I want you to go through some basic tutorials simply so you can kind of get to know R a little bit before we start doing serious things about it. And I'll post those and when I post them, I'll expect you to have gone through them by a certain date because that's when we'll start playing around on R ourselves. RStudio is a graphical user interface that I find is really good to work with. It has some functionality that goes beyond base R that allows you to do some things much easier. So for example, all of your assignments are going to be turned in using R Markdown. R Markdown is a way of creating reports from your statistical analyses. That works much easier in uh, RStudio than it does without it. So um, just go ahead and download R, then download RStudio. R is the base program. And you can't run RStudio without R. RStudio is just a graphical user interface, but it requires base R to be in place on your computer. Most of you have computers, have your own computers. I've only heard from one person who doesn't have their own computer. Bring your computer to class. When we start programming in R, when we start doing live coding, it's going to be much better for you to be doing that on your own computer than to be doing it on the class computer and then having to transfer stuff. Uh, so, so definitely do that. I work on a Mac, but I also know how R works on Windows machines. Uh, does anybody in here use Unix on a regular basis? Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Uh, already talked to you about course structure. Be here. This is one of those classes where if you're not here for a day of live coding, you're a day behind. And it's very difficult for you to catch up on that day on your own. Um, and I'll explain why that's the case in a little while. Uh, so, so do your best to be here at all, at all times. Um, I will do my best to be civil, but quite frankly, sometimes things that people do statistically just kind of piss me off because people misuse statistics all the time. But no, I will do my best to be civil. Um, don't cheat. I had a, a I had a, I had an honor code issue at one point in the semester. Do not share your code with one another. Do not share reports with one another. The temptation to lift stuff out of somebody else's code or somebody else's report is too high. Do your own work independently. If you're struggling with a particular coding issue, if you are struggling with how to structure your report or anything like that, come and talk to me about it. I know what I'm looking for. As a matter of fact, for the first report, before you turn in your first report, I'm actually going to write a report on an earlier data set that we worked on together in class that is structured the way I want you to structure your report. So you can follow that as a template. Um, and basically, it really is kind of a template. You just stick in the necessary things where they belong. So that'll be there for you to have as a template. If you're having trouble figuring out how to talk about a particular thing, once again, come to me and talk to me about that and we can work your way, work you through that and talking about a way that makes sense to you and also is accurate in terms of, of treating things statistically. Uh, when you turn in your assignment, because I ask you to turn it in in an R markdown file, I can see not only the code that you wrote, but I can also see the results that come out of it. That's one of the nice things about an R, R Markdown document. We'll look at an R Markdown document today so you can kind of see what that looks like. The nice thing about that is that I can see your actual code and what it produces without having to download your data set and your script and run it all myself as a way of, of grading that. What you shouldn't be surprised to find is that different people code differently. My wife is a bioinformatician. She works at, she's a postdoc at, at KU. She works on genomic data sets. Because she works on genomic data sets, she thinks about data in a way different than I do. And as a result, when we look at one another's code, because I need help with something or she needs help with something, a lot of times we're like, what are you doing there? 
because everybody codes differently. And so I can see in your code in the same way that I can read a written document from two students, and I can tell whether those two documents were written differently because of the language that the students use in those documents. And in a similar way, I can look at the code from two different students and I can see whether or not those two codes are independent or not because you just develop your own kind of habits and how you go about coding things. You're going to see how I code things and so you will probably pick up certain things about the way I code that you then incorporate into your own code, but then you have all this other coding experience that you have from other classes that you're also going to rely on as you go through this. So work independently. If you have trouble, come to me and I can help you with, with whatever it's doing. One of the nice things about this class is all of these data sets I've worked with extensively in the past, so there shouldn't be any anything that's throwing you that I can't help you figure out. Um, so that's it. Work independently and everything will be fun. Um, if you have learning accommodations, I need to know about those sooner rather than later. If you haven't filed the paperwork with Missy Henry, do so. And as soon as she has that process, she will send me, well, she'll send you an email and then you'll send an email to me and we will, we will work on that. There's only one exam. Sorry, in the course structure, I should have mentioned this. After we finish this section on statistical theory, I will give you an exam about that. And then that's the last exam. Everything else is problem sets and reports for the rest of the semester. The final exam is your final report, which is analysis of covariance. Turn that in, go on your way. This is a class that is all about doing. Uh, COVID, we already talked about COVID a little bit. Wear your mask, uh, behave responsibly when you're not here, and we will, we will get through this. Uh, there are a series of days when we do not have class. Uh, those are listed here. Um, I'm still working on the course schedule. I'm changing up some things at the beginning of the semester here for kind of how you get introduced to R that are results of feedback from, from course evaluations in past semesters. Uh, so that's rippling down through the rest of the semester. I'm still trying to work that out. I'll hopefully have a, a course schedule out to you. Um, later on today or tomorrow sometime. Keep in mind that course schedule can totally fall apart if you guys are struggling more with coding. Live coding tends to really slow things down. If people are getting it, it goes really quickly and smoothly. If people are not getting it, it's, it can really bog down. So um, there is some flexibility and we may speed up depending on how good you guys are. And we may slow down depending on how good you guys are. I will try and be sensitive to what you need in order to learn the live coding and be less focused on, oh, we have to get to analysis of covariance by the end. Um, so if you're having a lot of difficulty with the live coding, you definitely need to come and see me because what I don't want they don't want one or two people slowing the rest of the class down. If you're really struggling with it, come and see me in my office and we can work on things outside of class time rather than spending a lot of in-class time on that. Because of this, the due dates are going to be uh, assigned when the assignments are made. Um, so we'll just handle that as we go. I have basically told you you need to have your computers here every day. Just when you're here, don't be surfing the internet and don't be, don't be Facebooking or FaceTiming or whatever faces you do. Uh, be working on, on stuff having to do with class. Job date is April 18th. By then, you should know how you're doing in the class. Um, these are the assignments. And once again, the assignments reflect what I've already told you about the, the structure. At the beginning, we're going to be some, doing some basic statistics things. Then we're going to do a chi-square analysis, paired sample, problem set. 
Then you have an ANOVA problem set and the analysis, a two-way ANOVA problem set and the analysis, a regression problem set and the analysis. And then ANCOVA is the only statistical technique that is so involved that it's really difficult to work out by hand. So we'll go through really slowly conceptually with what it's doing, but it's the only analysis that I won't ask you to work out by hand. But analysis of variance relies on two techniques. It relies on ANOVA and it relies on regression. And if you understand those two techniques fully, then you should be able to latch on to analysis of covariance pretty easily. So that's the one thing where you'll, you will write a report about something having not actually done hand calculations for it because that's just one of the things that's actually a little more complicated to do hand calculations for. Um, 700 points. How many of those points do you garner? Determines what your percentage grade is. Your percentage grade determines what your, what your letter grade is. In this class, there is no reason why everybody can't get an A. Because your grade is determined by, can you do the technique? Can you talk about the technique in ways that get across to the reader what you did with the data, why you did it that way, and what the data mean? I will happily, happily award all A's. I will happily, well, okay, we'll happily award. It's up to you. I can award all A's or I can award all F's. It really doesn't matter to me in a sense, but this is certainly one of those classes where doing well in the class is just a matter of doing the work. Not a bunch of tricky questions on tests, not a bunch of writing opinions that you think that the professors are going to view kindly, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, here's the data, here's what I did with the data, here's what those data mean. If you can do that, you can do that in good English, completely, thoroughly, so that I understand what you did with the data and what the data mean, you're destined for A's. But you gotta do the work. So. Who's the guy who came in late? Oh yeah, let me see your card. Thanks. Jacob. All right. Uh, let's see, what else do I need to cover? Questions about the syllabus. Do you have any questions about the structure of the class? Do you have any questions about anything else? Okay, my name is Paul Kowinski. When I was an undergraduate student, I took a statistics class. It was basically, it was a probability and statistics class. We spent about half the semester on probability and the latter half of the semester on statistics, which means we didn't really get to a lot of statistics. And I wasn't getting it. I just was not getting it. Something about the way that professor taught it, the way that professor thought about it, just didn't resonate with me. I dropped the class at mid-semester. Came back during the summer, took it with a different professor. That professor approached it a different way, thought about statistics in a different way. It clicked with me. I took that class, I enjoyed it. Clara, how did I take the final in that class? I took the final in pen. She knows because I mentioned this in, in a class she took last semester. Took it in pen. That's how confident I was in my abilities at that point. Part of getting statistics is figuring out the way of thinking about statistics that clicks, that resonates with you. If it's not clicking with you, if it's not resonating with you, I need to figure out the way in which it will resonate with you. After I took that class, I took a non-parametric statistics class as an undergraduate. When I got to the end of my undergraduate career, the dean of the college that I was in 
uh, looked at my transcript is like, oh, you took statistics classes, a couple of them, you did pretty well. Do you like that? I'm like, yeah, it's enjoyable. He's like, oh, you're going into biology for graduate school? You should take as many statistics courses as you can. People will find value in that. So when I got to my master's program, the biology department and the College of Forestry had worked out a deal with the mathematics department where they would offer a set of applied statistics classes that the biology department and the College of Forestry guaranteed would fill every time that they were offered. And so I, while I was a master's student, I got a, a minor in applied statistics. I took a course on ANOVA, I took a course on regression, I took a course on multivariate statistics, and I took another course on, um, on non-parametric statistics. When I graduated, I went to a program at the University of Texas at Arlington that was a quantitative biology program. Um, at the time in Texas, in order to have a new PhD program, you had to distinguish it from other PhD programs in the state because the state of Texas didn't want to support two programs at the PhD level that overlapped with one another in terms of their focus. And so the way that the University of Texas at Arlington distinguished their program was it was a program in quantitative biology, which means I got there and I had to take more statistics. Not only that, I had to go back and take remedial math. I didn't have as enough math. I didn't have a, a third course in calculus and I didn't have linear algebra. So I was a PhD student back in undergraduate classes taking advanced math classes, which I hated. Luckily, I could take them pass-fail. All I had to do was pass. So um, in my first undergraduate class, we didn't really have statistical packages on computers that ran analyses. When I was in graduate school, I remember the day that my professor was all giddy. He came into class and we were like, why are you so happy? He's like, well, because I got something in the mail today. We're like, what did you get in the mail? He's like, I got SPSS. You guys know what SPSS is? It's the Statistical Package for the Social Sciences is what it stands for. He's like, I got SPSS for my desktop computer. At that point, we had been doing all of our analyses on the mainframe computer over in the computing center. You would sit at a terminal in your building. You would ship your programs off to the computer. It would crunch through them. You would go over there. You would get this printout on green and white striped paper. <laughs> and then that's, that's your analysis, and that's how you did it. When I got to my PhD program, I bought my own desktop computer, took out a student loan so I could buy a computer. And I had a statistics package on my computer sitting on my desktop. It was so freeing, so liberating. Now we walk around, <laughs> now we walk around with more computing power in our pockets than we had when I started out as, as an undergraduate student. Uh, my first hard drive in my first computer that I bought when I was a PhD student had 210 megabytes of storage on it. It was approximately the size of your standard building brick. Computing has come a long ways. We can do a lot on a laptop. Um, you will do a lot on your laptops or your desktops back in your dorm room or whatever. Um, when I was a grad student. I used a program called Statistica. It's a program produced by a company called Statsoft. It's really expensive. It costs about $1,200 a year to license. And I use that all through my doctoral work and into my work here at, University, at, at uh, uh, William Jewell College. And then people started talking about this R thing. I'm like, I don't need R. I'm using Statistica. I've always used Statistica. I know Statistica. Don't mess with me. And then finally, enough of the people that I interact with were using R. I finally decided, I guess I'm just going to have to learn this R thing. This gets back to attendance. I sat down one summer and said, OK, next time I teach applied stats, I'm going to use R. But I don't know shit about R. 
there weren't a ton of online tutorials about R like there are now. Now I'm saying R a lot. So I sat down and I spent a summer getting the basics of R underneath my fingertips. Worked the following fall through all of the examples that I used in class, working up R scripts that would analyze all of those things correctly, et cetera, et cetera. And then the first time that I taught this class using R, it was a struggle. It was a struggle for me. It was a struggle for the students, I think, partly because it was a struggle for me. Each year I get better and better at R. Being married to somebody who's a heck of a lot better at R than I am has helped, actually. It's not the only reason that I married her, but that's not a bad reason. Um, but teaching yourself R is hard enough when you have a graduate minor in applied statistics and a lot of statistical computing experience. Teaching yourself R when you don't have any of that is super hard. So be here because I don't want you to have to go through what I went through, which is picking all of this stuff up without a good guide. I'm going to show you some good online resources to use and things like this, but there's no substitute for being here in the classroom doing live coding where at any moment, if you hit a snag, you can raise your hand and I can come over and help you through whatever that is. Don't do what I did. Don't try and teach it to yourself. Um, you're not paying good tuition money to do that. So, so do your best to be here. Also, just because you don't get it the first time, don't feel bad about that. I didn't get it my first time. Yeah. Wayne didn't get it his first time. Um, so I know what that feels like. So I can help you with that. Uh, questions? You're data science majors. Why are you data science majors? Yeah. What's your name? What's your name? Karen. Karis. Okay. What else? Why are you data science majors? You can talk. Wait. Okay. What about the rest of you? Yeah. Tyler. Okay. I read the numbers a lot also. I'm constantly doing back of envelope calculations of this and that and the other thing. Irritate some people. Anybody else? Data science. I don't want to say this about a lot of majors. Data science is crucially important today. Why? Oh my gosh, we are awash with data. There's data everywhere. Log on to your computer. Google is taking data on you. Amazon is taking data on you. Facebook is taking data on you. I go looking for a woodworking tool on Rockler. Rockler is a woodworking website. I do woodworking as one of my hobbies. Next time I'm on Facebook, they're throwing ads at me for woodworking stuff. Where did they get that? Well, they got it from Rockler. You are awash in data. Transportation data. What has the effect of COVID been on transportation? It's reduced the number of highway miles that Americans travel. It's slowed down shipping, so the roads are less crowded, yet shipping is slowing down. What's behind those data? Tons of data coming, about the COVID, coming out about the COVID pandemic itself. What are rates of transmission? How many people are getting sick in which states, et cetera, et cetera? You are awash in data. 
And these data are important for all kinds of reasons. Knowing what to do with those data and how to treat those data appropriately is an important thing to know. Two big issues that are currently playing out in the United States. One is the COVID pandemic, and the second one is racial unrest over policing in the United States. If you're not aware of these two issues, crawl out from underneath whatever rock you've been living under for the last couple of years, join the rest of us in the 21st century. You guys have all heard about these two issues, correct? Both of these issues are issues that can be addressed to a certain degree with data. And if you're trying to make a decision, and hopefully when you get out of here, you'll have a job in data science, and you'll be working for somebody who has data and they want to know what those data mean. Whether it's a CEO at Cerner who wants to know data about sales, whether it's a CEO at Google who wants to know, once again, about ad revenue or whatever it happens to be, people have data and they want to use those data in making sane decisions. Decisions made that grow out of data and evidence are almost always going to be better than decisions that are made by going with our guts. You guys ever watch the movie High Fidelity? John Cusack? What does he say about thinking with your gut? Oh, no, he doesn't say that. I've been following my gut my whole life, and quite frankly, it's got shit for brains. John Cusack, the movie High Fidelity. Evidence-based decision-making is a common catchphrase in data science. It's a common catchphrase in government. But it's a good catchphrase because making decisions based on evidence is better than making decisions based on something else. Emotion, feelings, intuition. So I want to start us down this path today. In the folder, you will find a bunch of things for today. So I will generally arrange this class in folders by date. When you click on that folder, you will find a bunch of stuff in the folder for that date. There will be occasions when there won't be a folder with a date on it. And that's generally because we're continuing to follow up on the things that were in the folder from the day before. And so those are just signals to you that we're just continuing what we've done before. So in this file, there is a PowerPoint, which I have up on the board here in a minute. Um, there is a PDF that is a, a markdown output from analysis that I conducted on COVID cases in Kansas. And then there are two data files uh, of the COVID Kansas, Kansas COVID data file. And then there is a PDF of a publication that was put out by the Centers for Disease Control um, back in November of 2020. So it's, it's over a year old. It was back at the beginning part of the, of the COVID pandemic. So my goal for the next couple of days is to impress upon you why your chosen major matters. If somebody hasn't had this conversation with you in the data science program, we're having it now. But my goal for the next couple of days is to impress upon you that your chosen major has value. By the way, this is what I look like. <laughs> uh, that's me taking 15 minutes before class um, without the mask in my office, which is in White Science 142. It's one floor down over on the biology chemistry side right next to the skeleton of the horse if you ever need to find me. If you need to make an appointment with me for some time outside of office hours, my office hours are also in the syllabus, but if you need to talk to me at some other time than that, we can set up a meeting. Just send me an appointment via, um, via Outlook. I use Outlook for all my scheduling and I'll get you on the schedule. When you send me an appointment request, it gets it on your calendar and it gets it on my calendar. That way we both are reminded that we both need to be together at some point. You can either come see me in my office or if you're more comfortable doing it via Zoom or something like that, we can also arrange that. 
I got my Zoom license upgraded to Pro uh, at the beginning of the semester so that I can have sessions that are longer than 40 minutes. So I'm, I'm well equipped to work with Zoom. So why is statistics and data science important? Well, it's important because I'm asking you to wear masks. Here is a screenshot from the Centers for Disease Control website taken back. This was updated October 25th, 2021. And it basically tells you why you should wear masks, who should wear masks, when you should wear masks, where you should wear masks. So it's basically guidelines from the nation's preeminent disease control organization advising Americans on mask protocols, when we should be wearing masks, where we should be wearing masks. At the same time that we're getting this from the CDC, we're getting just two days ago, this from the Attorney General of the State of Missouri, who's basically going to be filing lawsuits, uh, suing local school districts who have mask mandates, because according to him, masks in schools are ineffective against the coronavirus. So you have these two competing narratives. How do you know which narrative is the correct narrative? Yeah. Thank you very much for playing along. That is exactly the answer I was looking for. OK, so data. What do data tell us about these two competing narratives? That's a very good question. So. What do data say about this particular issue in the United States, in the world, at this particular moment in history? Well, we have to ask ourselves, what kind of data would you bring to bear on this question? What kinds of data do you think would be useful in helping us decide which of these two narratives is the correct one? Yeah. Okay, transmission rates. Um, that's a pretty specific thing because you would have to actually know who was infected and see how many people that person infected. What's a surrogate for transmission rates? Hmm? Okay, you could look at this as a surrogate for transmission rate, the positive test rate. How many new cases are coming online day by day by day? What other kinds of data would we need to know? To, to tease this part, yeah. So knowing where people are getting infected, for those people who are getting infected, what else might we want to know? Sure. Uh, we could just go ahead and add to that death. But really, what's the purpose of wearing a mask? reduces transmission, which hopefully then reduces hospitalization, which then reduces death. So if you have a certain proportion of the population that gets infected, a certain proportion of those people end up needing hospitalization, then a certain proportion of those end up dying. So if you can reduce the number who get infected, that then reduces the number of hospitalization, which reduces the number of deaths, et cetera. Uh, what else would we need to know? Who's the economics major? Oh, uh, Karis, right? Um, you're an economics major. Do you? Is anybody else an economics person in here? Who won the Nobel Prize for Economics this year? I have no idea. Oh my gosh, really? Yeah. You should be paying to the attention to the Nobel Prize in Economics every year. I think it was two guys got the Nobel <laughs> Prize in Economics this year for utilizing natural experiments to look at employment data after the minimum wage was increased in the United States. So in the United States, uh, Pennsylvania was going to raise the minimum wage and New Jersey was not going to raise the minimum wage. 
and they looked at employment rates in Pennsylvania and in New Jersey right across the river from one another after they raised the minimum wage and looked to see if raising the minimum wage actually led to large-scale layoffs, which is what people were predicting. If you have to pay people more, employers are going to hire fewer people because each person now costs more to pay. And so there was this natural experiment that went on where one state did one thing, another state did another thing. Those two states were right next to one another. So broader economic issues probably weren't affecting employment rates in such a close proximity. Anybody want to guess what happened? Two unemployment rates? Did, did people in Pennsylvania fire more workers because they had to pay each worker more money? Just guess. How many of you say yes? How many of you say no? The no's have it. They found no difference in the two states in terms of the unemployment figures. They won a Nobel Prize in economics for doing this thing that ecologists have been doing for decades, finding situations where the variable that you are interested in varies naturally because of something that you didn't do. During COVID, there was a natural experiment that took place in the state of Kansas. In the state of Kansas, the governor called for a statewide mass mandate, but the legislature in Kansas challenged her on this and basically passed a law that said, if you wanted to opt out of the mass mandate by county, you could. So as a result, some counties in Kansas adhered to the mass ma mandate, other counties did not adhere to the mask mandate. We have a natural experiment where we have some counties that had the mask mandate and some cases that did not. This allows us then to look at the data on the number of cases, number of new cases per day that are happening in those counties where there was a mask mandate in place versus those counties where there was not a mass mandate in place. Yeah. Yes, it does. And it turns out population density doesn't matter in this case because what matters is really trajectories, what direction things are moving, but yes. But in this particular study, they corrected for population. Generally, when you want to compare these types of rates, you want to you see this reported by the CDC as the number of cases per 100,000 individuals. So what you do is you, you would take the number of cases, for example, in Wyandotte County, So we take the number of cases in Wyandotte County divided by the total population of Wyandotte County, and then you would multiply that rate times 100,000. That would give you the expected number of people per 100,000 people who are getting, getting diagnosed. That then makes populous counties comparable to, to uh, more rural counties, for example. So we would want to bring to bear on this question information about test rates, who's getting sick, et cetera, et cetera. And in the case of Kansas, we have this nice natural experiment where we have some counties that adhere to a mask mandate and some counties that opted not to. Where would you go to find these data? Online from where? So hospitals, potentially, yeah. Oh my gosh, do they? Yes, they do. And let me tell you, as a guy who went and got these data, it is the least user-friendly web portal on the planet. Because it'll give you data for the whole state. 
This is the trajectory for the whole state. You can see the beginning of the pandemic back in March of 2020. You see the rise during the winter of 2020 and into 2021. You can see the decline that is due primarily to people getting vaccinated. And then you can see the recent increase due to Omicron, which is why we're all in masks right now. There's a separate figure here where they have the timeline of when vaccines became available. So you can see when vaccines became available. You can see the time lag for reducing new rates, uh, new rates of new cases as a result of the first vaccines coming online, boosters coming online, and then this increase that is due to Omicron here in the very, very recent time period. Um, when you look at a figure like this, which it's a little easier to see, what do you notice about this figure? What are some peculiarities about the peaks? Okay, so it peaks in general during the winter. What else do you notice about that? Why, why would it peak potentially in the winter? Holiday season, people are traveling. What else? I was going to say like respiratory viruses generally peak in the winter when people are more so indoors. Respiratory viruses peak in the winter mainly because we're crowding more so indoors. Anytime you pack a bunch of people into a small space, rates of transmission go on simply because of close proximity to one another. This happens in college dorms every fall. Everybody comes back from the summer. We cram you into a bunch of dorms. You're in close proximity. We get this peak of, of illnesses of all types in the, in the fall, simply because of a crowding issue. What else, though, do you notice about this pattern? Where are the, where are the hmm? Oh, uh, I'm not sure what those, those lines are. I'm thinking of this this peak here. Look at this peak in detail. What do you notice about it? Within that broad peak, what do you have? You have a bunch of little peaks with valleys, little peaks with valleys. Blip, 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 blip. What's accounting for that? Yeah. Weekends. What you have is each of these dips is a Saturday and Sunday. Each of the peaks is midweek when reporting catches up. So you can look at a chart of data and you can see a lot about the data just from creating a simple graph. So we can go to state health. This is the Kansas Department of Health and the Environment, I think is what it's called. Yeah, the Kansas Department of Health and the Environment. You can go and you can painstakingly click on each of these counties and it will give you in a graph what the number of cases have been in that county. Unfortunately, they don't have any of this available in spreadsheet outputable form, which is unfortunate because what that means is that Paul Kowitzki had to go and painstakingly a year ago, get all those data by hand. Because I emailed the person who produced the original CDC report asking for her data. She never emailed me back. So I'm like, okay, I can do this on my own. What an idiot I was. So you go to find those data from places like the Kansas Department of Health and the Environment, which is tasked with tracking things like this. You can go to individual hospitals, but why do that when there's an organization, there's an agency, a state agency, that is already tasked with doing that for us? So then, once you've done that, then the question is, how do you analyze those data? So I went and did this. It was a total pain in the ass. It took me three days just to put the data together. Like three days, three eight-hour days of getting the data off of Kansas's clunky website. I will share with you the analysis on Friday. All right, questions? All right, I'll see you guys.